iHeartRadio presents Podversations, a weekly discussion with the biggest names and influencers in podcasting. Hey, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is easily my favorite part of the week. It's when we at iHeartRadio get to sit down with, uh, with people that we deeply admire and we want to get to know better. And we do that through the lens of podcasting. Uh, this medium that has continued to explode in the entertainment space across the last year. Um, about a year ago, we all entered into a bit of a new world order. Uh, as COVID hit and quarantine hit, we actually started to listen, slowly but surely, to more and more podcasts to fill that time. And so we here at iHeartRadio wanted to launch a, a weekly speaker series where we could sort of put tools down every Thursday at around noon Eastern and talk about podcasting, why it continues to grow so fast, and then talk about the people behind it. Who is creating in this medium? What is attracting them to the medium? What kind of content are they are they making? How are they using this medium? Um, today's session is, is super special for us for many, many reasons. It's one of our own podcasts that we are supporting on our platform because we deeply believe in its mission and its creator. Uh, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, welcome to the iHeartRadio weekly webinar speaker series. I seriously appreciate you being here for half hour this week. I know you're busy, so thank you. Thank you for having me. I also have the producer and executive producer on the show, Eves Jeffsko. Eves been at iHeartRadio making podcasts for a while now. Eves, I think I asked you to join this and this literally things are not happening right now at our company so that you could come here and talk to us for a second. So thank you too for joining us and, and sitting in. I'm happy to be here. And a full disclosure about 45 seconds before we went live, we're all realized that we're, we're within like 10, 20 miles <laughs> of each other in the great state of Georgia where nothing big going on here in Georgia. We're not helping to decide uh, the fate of the free world or anything like that. But that's kind of cool too. I think Dr. Joy, I live in a city called uh, called Decatur. I call it home. That's where your offices are too. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a pretty cool connection. Um, I want to jump in real quick. And, and Eves, if you'll let me, I'll steal the first question. One of the things that's been nuts in the last year is that it's it sort of forced us all to spend different times doing different kinds of things that maybe we wouldn't have normally done. So Dr. Joy, just to sort of break the ice a little bit, you got a lot of time in quarantine. Maybe you're sitting at home more often, maybe more time in your hands. What kind of shows are you watching? What are you streaming? What are you binging? Mm -hmm. So I kind of love kind of that, like watching TV is kind of a part of my job. Um, but so, but I definitely feel like it has increased during the lockdown, right? And so some of the things that I have been watching, I feel like like lots of people is Bridgerton, um, anxiously awaiting the podcast um, so that I can have a reason to rewatch it. Um, so I've been watching that. Um, I also am a huge reality TV fan. And so Married at First Sight just started a new season. So I've been watching that as well. That's awesome. You know, full disclosure, we have an incredible partnership with Shonda Rhimes and her company, Shondaland. We make a lot of podcasts with them. And the success of Bridgerton is absolutely phenomenal. I think that show is so smart. It's so smartly and sort of like quietly disruptive in ways where you're really enjoying the show, but then you realize it's actually brand new the way they're doing this. So it's yeah. been really neat to get behind the scenes talk uh, from them about how it was made. And we're going to reveal all of that in a podcast in the coming weeks, actually, that we're going to put out. What about books? You have an incredible platform that you've launched therapy for black girls, but mm -hmm. what kind of stuff do you read now to get inspiration from? You still read books? I do. I definitely do. So I just finished The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett um, and have recently started this book called Group, which is a memoir written by, uh, what's her name? I think Christy Tate, um, all about her experience in group therapy, which is pretty cool. You don't find a lot of books written about group therapy. Um, so that's the newest one that I started reading. Got it. And then lastly, to slowly get into podcasting here, again, your platform Therapy for Black Girls is also one of the more powerful podcasts we had ever heard. Um, what about you? Do you listen to podcasts a lot more and more? What kind of ones have you heard lately that have caught your ear? 
Yeah, I think like a lot of people, I started podcasting because of the podcast I was listening to. Um, so I am a longtime listener of The Read, which is one of my favorite podcasts. Um, I also really enjoy the Back Issue podcast. So they kind of talk about um, things from the past, like the BT Awards from 10 years ago or something like that, um, and kind of dig into like what made it so fun. Um, and Hidden Brain is another one of my favorite podcasts. Oh wow, those are, that's a lineup of the the absolute best podcast out there. I remember I, when I first I heard my first episode of the Read about two years ago, and my life quickly sort of organized into life before I had heard the Read and life after I had heard the Read. It really is that seminal, I think, a, a show, and it's just the way that they talk about issues. But anyway, Eves, to you to ask the first more serious questions. <laughs> yeah, that was like a perfect lead into my question because. I know that a lot of us really didn't expect to or really even think about being podcasters before podcasting became this huge thing. Like it's it's obviously and clearly blown up so much in the past several years, but um, it's still kind of a new thing. And so I was just kind of wondering what where were you before this path that led, led you into podcasting? Um, what were you doing prior to this huge platform that you have now that is therapy for black girls? Yeah, so I was actually the director of the counseling center at Clark Atlanta University. Um, so like we've already talked about where we live in the city. So I had about a 45 minutes to an hour commute both ways to my job, which is when I fell in love with podcasting. So it felt like a great way to kind of pass the time. I actually really missed and cherished that time because it felt so um, like something just for me. Um, so that's when I fell in love with podcasting. And I was already blogging on the Therapy for Black Girls site. But once I got introduced to podcasts, I thought, wow, this would be a really cool way to share the same kinds of information that I'm sharing in the blog, but in the podcast format. Um, and so my husband has experience in radio. Um, so I knew that I didn't have very far to look in terms of producing. So it felt like a really easy leap for me to just kind of take a chance at doing something different. And really, it just kind of blew up. And when somebody approaches you now and says, what's your day job? What do you do? <laughs> How do you, with some of the platform like Therapy for Black Girls, you have a lot of different tentacles that you've, I think, very, very smartly extended this into. But how do you answer yeah. that question? Yeah, I say that Therapy for Black Girls is my full-time job. So I talk about, you know, running the podcast as well as um, managing our therapist directory, which is also a part of the site. So mental health. Um, maybe just to stop down for a second, take 30 seconds and just tell our viewers, what do you, what do you do? Your doc, your, your, your Dr. Joy Bradford, what is your background? What's your expertise? Um, and then we'll get into, I think that sort of very critical questions that just mental, mental health generally in the mm -hmm. country in the last year. But first you, what, what's your background? Yeah, so I am trained as a psychologist. I went to the University of Georgia for my PhD program in counseling psychology. So lots of roots to Georgia here. Um, so I was practicing, like I said, I was at the University or Clark Atlanta University most recently, but my background is in college student mental health. And so on every campus that I was on, I would always run a group for the Black women on campus um, because there's a huge stigma related to mental health really in the Black community. And so it just felt like Black women were not coming to the counseling centers at the same rate as their peers. So it felt really important for me to go to where they were in either the Multicultural Student Union or in their residence halls to let them know that I existed, to let them know what kinds of resources were available, and to start some conversations with them about how they could take care of their mental health. So but, so that I don't just barrel ahead to the next question, because I think you just said something really interesting. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that that Black students in particular, or maybe Black female students in particular, were reticent to seek help like that on campus? And was that a first signal for you of like, whoa, this is a weird thing I did not know about and maybe I can fix in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it wasn't anything new to me. I mean, throughout my training, a lot of it was focused on um, just the disproportionate ways that mental health shows up in the Black community and the cultural history just related to stigma. You know, we don't typically come from families where lots of people have gone to therapy. Um, historically, 
it is seen that you had to be crazy, quote unquote, right, to go to a therapist. And, you know, there have been lots of ways where mental health has been used to actually weapon, has been used and weaponized against the Black community. So it's not been always okay for people to come forward and say that they are struggling. And so I really felt like even throughout my graduate training that my purpose or part of the work that I wanted to do was to make it easier for Black people to get connected to services. So interesting. So mental health, the last year that we've all had, I think is is maybe the biggest issue really hidden inside quarantine is the mental health of our country. I have four kids. We went through 12 months of uh, uh, virtual learning, in-person learning, then virtual learning again. Um, it, it Not to dramatize it, but I've definitely seen sort of firsthand the effect of that on kids, not being mm -hmm. able to socialize and be with their friends. And and um, so I feel like there's mental health issues that as a country we're broadly aware of. Are there sort of hidden mental health issues that you as an expert might say, yes, but actually there are there are issues off of our radar to do with mental health that aren't getting talked about as much that are actually even more important. Maybe just give us some insights on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, kind of, I actually think that the mental health impact on the other side of the pandemic is going to be much larger than anybody really is discussing. Well, I think people in the field are discussing, but it feels like we are kind of like shouting into the vortex, like, hey, you need to pay attention to this. Um, because I think what is happening and what has been happening for this past year is that there have been um, just constant situations where we have been traumatized, you know, in a lot of different ways and just an overwhelming sense of grief. Grief related to the loss of loved ones for people who have lost loved ones. Grief related to, you know, our whole sense of normalcy being upended. Um, loneliness and isolation has really increased. You know, we talked about it for kids, but I think for adults as well. And so I think on the other side of this, there will be a sense of shock um, that people will, will be able to kind of really understand like what this past year or year and a half has been like, and people will really have to grapple with like what has happened. And so I think there will be a real need for supports and for services that are really already tapped out. Um, so I think that is a conversation that I hope people will take more seriously. And, you know, of course, part of what I want to do with the platform so that people can understand like this is something that we need to get ready for to be able to help people. It's really interesting. Eve, back to you. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing that I've really appreciated over the years of your podcast is just how much work is done and all the different ways through the platform that it's that it's done to really destigmatize conversations around mental health. I mean, just from my personal circles and in circles I see on social media through the great work that you do and just really uplifting the conversation around that is something that I've I've seen just over the course of my short short, you know, lifetime and this short years in which mental health has become more of a conversation. And I, I really think that the platform therapy for B Black girls has been one that has really contributed so much to that. And I just wonder as well, how how has your, how has therapy for Black girls and how has the podcast changed since you first launched it in 2017? Mm. Yeah, you know, I really launched this, like I said, just as an idea, right? Like just as a way to kind of stay more engaged with the community. So people were reading the blog, um, but but nowhere near the rate where people are listening to the podcast, right? And so it really just felt like it hit at the right time because this was a conversation that really needed to be had. Um, and so I think, you know, I have definitely gotten more sophisticated, um, have added people to the team to help me. Um, you know, what has not changed is that I still record in my home closet, which I think is a really cool kind of origin story for the podcast. Um, you know, but I definitely think I am much more intentional about like paying attention to what the community wants to hear about and being very responsive to them. Um, I think that that's one of the things I love the most about the platform is that it really just feels like I am in constant conversation with them. So there will be something that happens in the community and then the next week they know that it's likely there's going to be a podcast episode about it. So I think that that's been really cool. Is there things you've learned in doing the podcast that have informed your work as, as a psychologist? Is it sort of going back and forth? I fully understand that you're pulling all that expertise into podcasting, but is there something about the medium too that you're like, oh, I could sort of change the way that I'm a doctor just because of this show? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think that I am much more in tune with like group dynamics. So I kind of envision the listeners and the community surrounding the podcast as one large group. And so I think that that has also um, encouraged me to consider running groups in my practice. So my practice is purposely really small because of all of the things related to um, therapy for Black girls. But it has definitely encouraged me to think more about how I can do more group work, which I think will also be really critical on the other side of the pandemic, because again, there will not be enough providers to go around for all the people who are going to need services. And so that's something that I've really been seriously thinking more about. So interesting that you talk about the other side of the pandemic that way, because I, I think before throwing back to you, Eves, uh, it, it, is, it is sort of the untold other part of this, is I think we're all ecstatic to be slowly emerging, hopefully, from quarantine, but you're right, there may be a sort of um, psychological lag to all of this where it's like, whoa, what did I just go through for good and mm-hmm. bad? That I, I I guess you're right, we're not really clocking it. It's all ecstasy at this moment. It's like, let's just get out of, right. of quarantine as fast as we can, but, uh, but back to you, Eve. Yeah, I, I know that there are so, so, so many layers to the topic that is mental health. And because you've had hundreds of episodes so far, you've really been able to touch on a lot of them. Um, and uh, of course, there's so much more that you can dig into. But I was wondering if there's any, if there are any topics that you've ever been hesitant to cover. Like, is there anything that's come up that you didn't want to? You, you were a little bit maybe more uh, fearful or apprehensive about talking about because it was something that was, you were just delving into, or something that was really heavy on our minds at the moment. Anything like that that you were maybe hesitant to get into, but did end up covering on the podcast. And it was something that really turned out to be beneficial for your audience. Mm -hmm. I think that there have been several of those moments, Eve, but I think the first one that I remember um, was right after all of the events in Charlottesville, Virginia, right? When they had that, um, you know, I don't even know what to call it, riot or whatever, um, where, you know, once someone was killed and, you know, all of the white supremacists were marching on campus. Um, I was really, really impacted by that and, and really just felt like I knew that my community would expect me to address it, but I really didn't want to. Like, I felt like really tired of giving energy to it. I think that, you know, I had probably already done a couple of episodes about like, you know, racism and how it impacts our mental health. Um, I think that that wasn't too long after like the Las Vegas shooting. Um, And so I I think I felt really just worn down and just felt like I don't want to address that, but I knew that my community needed to hear my voice about it. And so I did do the podcast and I think was very open about how I was feeling and like I didn't want to do it. I shared that on the podcast. And I think anytime I do those kinds of episodes, I do think the community um, is closer to me, right? Because I am giving voice to some of the things that they are also struggling with. And so I think that they appreciate when I can share about how I'm feeling about something happening in our lives as well. And can you talk about the response that you get? What What are some of the things that people say to you in, in the aftermath of those episodes and those occurrences? Mm-hmm. So we get lots and lots of emails, lots of direct messages, which I love. Again, I think it's just continuing part of the conversation. Um, but people appreciate, you know, me giving voice to that. Um, I get messages that talk about them feeling like, oh, I hadn't even thought of it that way, but I noticed now my mood was impacted and now that may be a part of why. Um, You know, so I think giving people language for like some emotions or things that may be going on with them that they didn't have otherwise has been a really, really cool part of the work that I've been able to do with the podcast. What drew you to psychology to begin with? Like just to go way back to the origin stories, even before... (laughs) Uh, counseling at a college or UGA, what drew you to this? And and yeah, and and, and as a second question, we don't of, often end up treating or working directly in fields that we are we are about. Therapy for Black girls. At one point in your life, you were a Black girl. You ended up launching a huge, incredible platform to help that community. What what drew you to this? Why not any of the hundred other careers you could have done and probably been awesome at? Was there a spark as a kid that you just were were sort of led to this by a parent or a relative or something that you read in high school? What do you think it was? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so my mother calls it being nosy. I call it being very curious. Um, so I have always been somebody who is just really in tune with human behavior. Like I am the person kind of making up stories about people I see kind of passing on the street. Like I've just always really been interested in that. And I had an opportunity to take a correspondence class in high school about psychology and instantly fell in love. So I knew that once I went to college, that was going to be my major. Um, I went to school, though, thinking that I would be a psychologist professor like that is what I thought I wanted to do was to teach um, but then I had an opportunity to uh, do like a internship practicum kind of experience where I watched somebody do therapy and then I knew that that is what I wanted to do um, and so I think being a member of the community that I now serve feels very natural to me um, I think you know a part of my upbringing is to kind of like always be of service to other people and I think that there's something really poignant of kind of being the person that you felt like you needed at some point in your life, right? And so, you know, having mm-hmm. these kinds of conversations that I have on the podcast feel like a natural extension of the conversations I heard my mom and, and her sisters have, the kinds of conversations I have with my girlfriends, the kinds of conversations I have with clients. And so it actually felt very natural um, and a natural extension of the kinds of things that I was always already doing in my life to then start the platform. Is therapy still a big part of your, your week? Not very big. So I do still have like two or three clients I see, but much more of my work is um, the podcast and the directory. Is there any part of that that you never want to let go of? Uh, I don't want to I don't want to lead the witness, but like, is that part <laughs> of you that like, I, I always need to be doing that even just a little bit? Yeah, I I really love, you know, it really is just so interesting. I mean, like five, six years ago, if you had told me that this would be my life, I would have laughed because my ultimate goal was always to have like this lucrative private practice where I just help people. And that was always the vision. And now my life looks very, very different from the thing that I had envisioned several years ago. Um, And so I strongly identify as a therapist and I feel like being a therapist is what allows me to connect to my community through the podcast in the way that I do. So I feel like that is something I never want to give up. Even if it's just a little bit of therapy, I definitely want to always be doing that. That's really cool. Yeah. It does feel like it's been amplified so much though, like going from just thinking about this small practice that you have of yours, but then the amount of listeners that you're able to reach on a a week to week basis is just like the, the impact that you've had is just so much more amplified because of all of the people's ears who, who you touch every week. So mm-hmm. I, I also think that that goes back to what you were saying about the, the destigmatization and just like the conversations you're having, they're fun a lot of the time. And, and we don't have to be so afraid of, of these conversations around mental health, even if we're not necessarily ready to go speak with a therapist in person or even have access to those resources yet. And I think that that's opened up the, opened up the conversation so much more. Um, are there any experiences that you've had and maybe researching an episode or um, just the conversations that you have had with guests that come on that have maybe been learning experiences for you where you didn't know much about something or maybe you were enlightened on something or, or changed your mind about something in the process of doing that research for an episode or having that conversation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like I walk away from all of the conversations I have on the podcast learning something. Um, you know, I think that that's the cool thing about practicing as therapists, right? Like, there are some things that, like, likely all of us do, but then there are other things that people are highly specialized in, right? Um, so I had a conversation on the podcast about um, with a hypnotherapist, which is something that I've not had any training in, but was such a cool conversation and I learned so much about it, um, as well as a therapist who practices EMDR. So this is a type of therapy primarily used for people who have had very traumatic experiences where they use like these lights and really help you to kind of go back to the, the scene of the trauma and like help you to kind of rework it so that you kind of, you know, can work through some of those symptoms that you're having. So, I mean, I have just learned so much and I think that that's a part of what people enjoy too is that when they hear me on the podcast, it's not like this expert talking down to people. It really is, hey, come learn this thing with me and you're learning while I'm learning. Um, So I think I ask the questions on the podcast that many of my listeners might also be listening or asking. Um, So I I don't think that there's been a conversation I've walked away from where I didn't learn something. So cool. Well, listen, I I deeply appreciate you you being in partnership with us. Uh, this uh, This is our favorite kind of show to work on because 
it was a show that we all were fans of and listened to long before we ever got to talk to you and 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 try to support you and and grow this show in our in our network. Um, I know you're busy. You're you're not just doing cool content. You're doing what I think is really good, important work. Um, and and so I deeply appreciate you taking a half hour to talk to me and Eve's today, uh, Dr. Joy. Thank you for that. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Eve's, thanks thank for hanging you. out with me too. Uh, you made yeah. this even more fun than it was going to be already. But uh, yeah. but Dr. Joy, stay safe, stay sane. Uh, at some point here in Georgia, we'll all go out and get a coffee together when time is normal. And and if your prediction is correct. We may be one of those two or three clients you have next year because we may need more help than we're aware of coming out of quarantine and going back to normal a little bit. But thanks again, Dr. Joy. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for watching this week. It means a lot to us that you hung out with us for this half hour. We will be back next week for another weekly webinar series. Everybody take care. Stay safe. Podversations is a production of iHeartRadio. You can find more from the biggest names in podcasting on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts.